I'm chatting with J.M. Blakely, and we're going to be chatting essentially about his approach to training. So for those of you who aren't familiar with J.M., I'm just going to let him intro himself. So J.M., first off, thanks so much for jumping on the uh, the call today. Super excited to chat with you about uh, about your bench press training. Um, I've been following you for a long time, and there have been a handful of things that I've taken from uh, some of the advice that you've given out that I think is just you know, really, really valuable. And I, I think it's it's going to be a really interesting conversation to have. So would you uh, introduce yourself and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, kind of what you've been up to? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is J.M. Blakely, and that stands for John Mark. It's one word, John, John Mark, all squished together. Uh, just so in the interest of not people uh, messing it up when I was a kid, my grandmother just called me J.M. So there you have that. <laughs> um, I'm an old guy that used to lift uh, I went toe to toe with the best in the world and I stood up for myself pretty well. And, um, so I have some real life experience with the, with the band. and, um, you know, I know what it's like to, to win big and I, I know what it's like to, to, to fall big. So th- those are, those are both valuable. Um, I, I did, I educated myself in, in exercise physiology as well as, uh, metaphysical science, which is sort of, the inner side of, of things. Um, it, it doesn't seem like those two things would go together, uh, you know, really, really going deep into the body and physiology and also going into this real esoteric, abstract mental stuff. But I found at, uh, it was very clear to me at one point that, uh, I couldn't take it any further physically. I had done everything that I could do. I mean, I was, I was getting my PhD in exercise physiology from one of the best universities, Ohio state university. And I I applied all that stuff they taught me and I still couldn't be the best in the world. I was third in the world. And I thought, what, what can I do to, to be number one in the world? I, you know, third is not satisfying. You know, when you're, when you're that close, uh, there's nothing that matters, you know, top 10 and, and you're working your way up and it's all about number one. And that's, that's all that matters. And so, uh, I started thinking about the psychology classes that I took sports psychology. I took three and a general one. And it dawned on me that that's an area of my training that I had not really developed. And so I did all the psychology stuff, the mental stuff, the mental stuff, the mental stuff. But that, that quickly led to some more esoteric things, things that aren't quite mental. They're not, they may or may not be spiritual. Uh, they're certainly emotional and from the heart. And, you know, martial artists are, are, are well renowned for that. And so I started reading about that kind of thing. And we can talk about that. Uh, I can explain that a little bit deeper. But, um, and that, that's what took me there. I mean, I, I, was, I was a pretty ordinary guy. I, I still am. And, and I did some extraordinary things because I was able to put together not just the physical. I had that down, but I didn't have the physical gifts that my competitors did. Um, I added in the mental and, you know, some pretty strong discipline. That, that's easily teachable and you can get even kids to do that. But then the thing that I think took me uh, where I wanted to go was that that other thing that that metaphysical stuff and you know some of it is uh pretty hard to swallow but um i always say this it's more important to know how to use something than to know what it is meaning i i don't i can't tell you how my car works per se but i can work it and so i can do the same thing with my spirit soul heart whatever you want to call it i can't really tell you what it is but I know how to get to it and I know how to put it in action. And so uh, that's, that's a little bit of background. Yeah. So you actually said quite a few things there that were, that were pretty interesting. Um, the one thing I couldn't agree with more is not necessarily relying on having like a clear mechanistic rationale for things, because a lot of the times like that follows, you know, in- intuition is usually pretty accurate when, when you have a high level of experience and then also it usually precedes understanding in, in a lot of cases sometimes with, with lifting, right? You're like, you know, I was, I was talking about this uh, with someone the other day and, and essentially I was saying how, you know, as a coach, when you go to individualize your program for an athlete, 
when I really sat down and tried to say like, okay, what is my actual customization approach? How do I, how do I approach this process? I didn't have a clear explanation for it. It was more of an intuitive process and I did things that way. Now things have changed and I do have an actual approach, but I mean, again, it, it just kind of goes uh, in line with what you were saying, where a lot of the times it's, it's, uh, you know, important to understand how to use something. And a lot of the times understanding of what those mechanisms are come, come later. Um, Let me ask you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I have a question for you, Dan, about your, about sure. how you custom the program and what parts of that are important to you. So when you say I, I personalize a program for somebody, mm -hmm. what are you speaking of? What do you personalize? What, what, what do you so I, I want to customize the mental approach that, they, that I take with them and that I teach them to approach their training. I think that is, is far superior. There are great set and rep programs out there. I, there's a great variety of exercises that are fantastic. And one guy chooses one exercise and he does a certain sets and reps and he has great success with that. And another guy will choose another program. He'll do a different exercise, slightly different. Uh, same muscle group, though, right? Uh, different tricep exercise, different bicep exercise. And he'll get a, a different set and rep scheme. And he'll get fantastic results with that. And I think they're both within the same range of human variation. Now, they, don't, they won't say that, but, but I, I, I've studied physiology enough to know that human bodies are basically all the same. Where we really, really differ, I mean, crazy differences is inside our head and, and how we, we approach a task. What's heavy to somebody, you know, if you decide something is heavy, it is. It's just 100 pounds. It's not trying to help you. If you decide 100 is heavy for you, you're going to struggle with it. If you look at 100 as something that's doable, you'll do okay with it. And if you look at it as light and easy, it's still just 100 pounds. But your attitude towards it, and this is where I think, I, this is where I do most of my customization and personalization. I, I do the things that you do too. But, but I think the most important thing is in getting people to have a relationship with the, 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 the training. How do they relate to what you're asking them to do? And I've had people that are crazy wimps, and I've had people that are impervious to even self-destruction. They'll go until they break. So I've seen a range of, of this, this relationship to the work. And it doesn't matter what work you give them. High reps, some guys will just go forever. You know, high weight, some people just, you know, love the strain. And, and the opposite is true, too. And so I think that... Um, for me, so this is one of the things where I think I look at training very differently than, than lots of people. I see a huge focus, especially in coaching, but also athletes want this. They seem to want sets and rep schemes, sets, reps, percentages. What's my percentage? What's my progression? What's, what, how, much, how much percentage this week and how much? And that's all well and good, but it doesn't really matter as much as people think it does. What really matters is getting somebody to be determined, to be relentless, to be willing, and this is a huge word for me, willing to give everything in the moment. Now, that could be a set of six or a single rep max or a set of 25 on the leg press. <clears throat> All of those things, that willingness, that's a big, big, big one for me. I think that that willingness and, and, and that's where I have to customize my programs. How willing is this person to give me what's required? So there's 100 pounds on the, on the bar. You've got to lift with at least 101 pounds to make it move. So is this person, how willing is this person to, to give 101? Or if they want to move it faster, 120 pounds of force, you know? And, and, and so that's where I spend most of my time customizing and choosing the other things. So what informs my decision, and you said this at the beginning, I, I give you credit. You said about the personality, you know, of, of somebody, and, and, I, and, and that's where I want to go with it. And, and I, think, I think we put way too much 
as coaches and as athletes, people have, have fallen into this distraction. They're distracted by the sets and reps, and they're looking for the perfect uh, formula for them, you know. And they want a formula in numbers, and that's not what makes a champion ever. It never has. It never will. What makes a champion is heart, willingness, um, you know, pure effort, willing to give. And you see this in kids all the time when they finally get it on the football field. You see a couple kids. Just it, it just dawns on them. And then they, you know, they just run through other people once they get that. Um, and you see it in the weight room, too. When somebody really gets it, they they make a big jump in progress, no matter how long they've been stagnant. So we probably spent enough on that. But um, that's that's one thing that would be different about me is I I minimize the sets and reps. And because there's there's great programs and they've been proven they all work. They all work. If somebody puts in enough work, that's the key. How do I get this person to give me the work to make X, Y, or Z program useful for them? And so I just thought I would mention that. And I played around with you there a little mm -hmm. bit, Dan. I was just I was just having fun with the, you know, asking me <laughs> all this stuff. Yeah. Because I'm doing that, you know. And and I think it it, it brings out um Lots of things when we do that too. So, what what else do you want to talk about? I'm sorry, I, I kind of went off. And that's that's no different. no that's fine. I mean, it makes sense, and that that's kind of been a concept that I've been playing around with for a while in my head. Like, I'd say the last maybe year and a half, two years, I've been less and less convinced that uh, the sets and the reps and all that stuff matters as much as just effort. Um, <laughs> Because, because like you said, you know, you look at West Side and then you look at Chico, and it's like these are essentially diametrically opposite um, approaches to training, and yet they both have just an, an insane number of very elite lifters. And so that, to me, at least suggests that hey, maybe it's less about the programming, the the you know cycling of intensities and things like that, and it's maybe has a little bit more to do with you know, the, the level of effort that you're putting into your training. And I mean, if you can train super hard all the time and stay injury free, then you're probably going to get pretty far. And I think the staying injury free thing does a pretty good job at, as a caveat, because that kind of, you know, suggests that you do have to dial things back every now and then you do have to make sure you're taking care of yourself, you're sleeping, all that stuff. And, you know, if you're not prioritizing nutrition, sleep and whatever else, then you're probably going to get injured. And so, yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, the core concepts that you're, you're uh, I guess, espousing. So that leads to, I guess, the, the first question, which would be essentially, like, how would you approach the, the development of a powerlifter? Like, let's say someone's an Dan, intermediate athlete. They've got a decent back. level of experience. Dan, could we go back to what you just said before we, before we attack that question? You, you brought up a really good connection that you made when you said, uh, I'm not so great. I'm not so sure that the sets and reps are all that important um, because there's 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 so huge variation and all of them are successful. And then you said, um, so I think that that effort is really something that uh, you and I can agree on that that might be super super important. But then you took it one step more, and and I want to follow that thread. Uh, you mentioned injury and and. And that's absolutely true. And injury is sort of a matter of awareness and attention. And we can talk about that too. But I like that you said something about taking care of yourself. And to me, that implies return. And that's like the third, the third step. So I, I minimize the, uh, the sets and reps. You know, lots of programs work. So just find one that the trainee likes the most. They'll, they'll work the hardest at that. Get them to work hard. I think that's super, super important. But and I, I didn't say this, I might, I should have, but equally important as that, equally as important as teaching them to put it on the line and to trust themselves. And the only way you learn to trust yourself is to put yourself on the line and see what you got. And, mm -hmm. and you got to push people really hard to do that. But equally important then is what I, I think you mentioned, recovery. I believe recovery has to be in equal measure to intensity. If you fail that, if you fail to, to grasp 
that recovery has to pay for all that intensity that you just taught them to, to pour out, you know, in the room, um, they're going to either overtrain, under recover, which might be the same term, or get hurt. So I just wanted to, I just wanted, to, you mentioned that all on your own, and I wanted to, to reinforce that idea to anybody that's listening that um, sets and reps for me, not, not, not crazy important. Find something that you, that you love to do and, and do it to death, but do it at a very high intensity and a very high intensity of recovery. You know, so so I, I just want to reinforce that idea of balancing the 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 effort, which you agree is super important, with recovery, which I think is super important. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> essentially, that's that's kind of what initially led me to to be a little less confident in any particular approach to training. As, as being uniquely beneficial uh, in comparison to others. Like, obviously, there's good training and bad training. Like, I'm not going to give someone five sets of 10 at 98%. Like, that's ridiculous, you know. But outside of just being completely, you know, nonsensical, I don't know that there's an inherent benefit to one approach over the other. Like, I, I see percentages and RPE and exercise variation and all, all of the things that you can implement from like a program design standpoint as essentially trying to attack those two ends of the spectrum. How do we push as hard as possible and recover as well as possible so that we can sustain high level training while minimizing the, the potential risk for injury and then do that for 20 years, essentially, you know? Um, and that, that's kind of why I'm like, well, there's just so many different ways that it can be done. I don't know that one way is better than the other, you know, like even just, you know, I have friends who, who program and who are coaches and who are, you know, very strong as well. And I look at what they're doing and I look at what I'm doing and then I look at what other friends are doing and we're all doing different shit and we all seem to be getting stronger. So I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's good enough for me, you know, um, a lot of great programs yeah. uh, and they're all, yeah. all proven. No, there are. You gotta pick those. I mean, you can't, yeah. I don't like these people to say everybody's different and you got to find the perfect one for you. No, you don't. You find one that you like and you, and you beat it. You know, you go in there and you pound it and, and it's going to work for you, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you had chosen another one, if you pound it and recover, it would have worked for you. And if you had chosen a different one, it would have worked as well. So it's not like we right. have to do all the discovery, self discovery of, of our own personal now you should customize your own. That's what we, we were talking about. You know, that's definitely something you should do. You should find your niche, but, um, <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's not the end all be all. And I think people really, really focus on that and they get stuck there and they don't do what you and I were talking about, which is learn to give the effort and learn to pay for the effort in recovery. And, um, so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not, I'm not misunderstood uh, saying that, there's, there's a perfect program for everybody and you got to go find yours. You know, your answer is you and blah, blah, blah. Now, any good program that has, that has been out there a while is going to work for you. If you do the other two things, you bust your ass, you give it all you got and you pay the price for that in sleep and nutrition and staying out of the gym and, uh, taking care of your stress and, um, the rest of your life balancing all the things that pull you, uh, you know, so, um, okay, let's go on to that other question. I just really wanted to reinforce that because it's, I think it's just as important as everything else we were talking about. No, for sure. So yeah, essentially we we're talking about the development of a power lifter. Um, so how you approach that, obviously, you know, from the sound of it, there's, there's a big, um, sort of internal approach that you take to, to the development of an athlete. But let's say, you know, you took me on, let's say I'm, you know, maybe one year in or two years into lifting, how would you go about approaching the development of, of me as one of your athletes to bring me to an elite level of, of competition? Okay. Uh, let me ask you a question, Dan. What's the last book you read? Um, to be honest, I haven't read a book in a long time. I just kind of find it a little bit of a waste of time nowadays. I mostly, I read a lot, a lot of research. 
Yeah. Okay. Stop. Um, I used that's to where read a lot, and then I stopped. <laughs> this is where this is where I would start. You said this is, and this is where I start. Um, mm-hmm. In the gym, I do a ton of technical work. It takes a year to learn how to squat. A ton mm-hmm. of technical work in the gym, but that's not where I start. I start on the inside. Champions are all made from the inside out. And if you fail to understand that, you'll constantly be working on the superficial stuff. And when the wind blows, you won't have any roots. Uh, and, and the wind blows pretty, pretty hard at the top of the mountain. So as you climb up and you're doing your, your gym work, you're going to start moving up and the wind gets strong. And if you don't have some roots inside deep, uh, you're just going to get blown away. And, and that's a, a lot of people do. I mean, that's why there's only, you know, one stone at the top of the pyramid. There's only one guy. And, and so lots of people get blown away. That's, that's no crime. But if you want to be that guy or you want to be near the top, you better have some something solid underneath you. And so where I would start is uh, some reading material. And if you balk on that, I'll know something about your commitment to being a champion. So I, I, I'll, I'll know about how far you can get. You can get as far as it's comfortable for you and your lifestyle. Meaning, if I ask you to do something and you don't do it, that must have been uncomfortable for you. It must have been something outside your willingness to be a champion. Because I'm telling you directly, without any question, it has to be done. And if you're saying, well, you know, I don't have time for it and I, I don't really like to and I read and I fall asleep. I've heard all the excuses. You know that. Um, mm-hmm. Or I read on, on my phone, you know, I, <laughs> which means you, you read you read blurbs, uh, you know, one sentence at a time. But uh, th- this is the value of reading. And this is not just for powerlifting or mental toughness or, or uh, uh, anything. It, it's, it's everything. The smartest guys in the world, in every subject, in everything that you want to do, the smartest people have written down their thoughts on paper. And you can read them and put them in your head, too. So you might not be the smartest guy. I'm not. But I read all the smartest guys. And whatever they were thinking, I can now think about myself. And I can decide whether I agree, disagree, or partially agree. And I'll take some of it and throw some of it away because you're allowed to do that. I teach people when they read that you don't have to buy the whole book and swallow it. You can just take the bites that, uh, that apply to you. And it's okay to say, this one guy said this crazy thing and that was bullshit, but I learned this really important thing from him. That's valuable. And, and people think, well, I start reading this book and I didn't like what this guy, where this guy was going, so I didn't finish it. There might have been a nugget for you that could last you your whole life at the end of that book. And, and so, you know, I, 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 I don't give people books that, that I don't think that there is that in them. But not everybody gets the same value out of everything. And so I, I, but, so I, I try to be, uh, I try to customize and personalize what, what books I I give from my own um, experience and it, it, and I always give somebody something that I think is going to be valuable for them. I do my best, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm wrong and sometimes it takes a while. I know I've read a lot of books and it took a while for them <laughs> years, years, Dan. Uh, I finally think I'm starting to understand the art of war after about 17 years. It's not about war at all. It's about winning. So what are some of those books what are some of those books that you recommend? Well, uh, I would start, I, I like to start with the Tao of Pooh, the T-A-O of Pooh, like Winnie the Pooh. Oh, I, re- I read that like, it must have been like eight, ten years ago or something like that. Okay, read it again now as a power lifter, Dan. There you go. So, there, so <laughs> It's actually a pretty good book. Go read that again. And now, see the value <clears throat> less, not trying quite as hard. Now, Western mind, I, I grew up Western. I'm a, I'm a go-getter. I'm, I'm going to come right at you. But um, that's not always the way. Sometimes the way is under or over or around. It's not always through. It's not always through. And it takes a while for the Western mind to say, I can achieve my goals 
not by putting my canoe in the water and paddling upstream because all good things are upstream and I got to work, work, work. No, sometimes I can get what I want by getting in a canoe and letting it take me downstream almost effortlessly. And there, that's, that's one little part of that book. But it introduces the, the idea of finding the flow in the universe, aligning yourself with it, and adding your energy to the flow of the universe's energy. It's a lot easier to get stuff. It's a lot more than just your energy fighting <clears throat> the universe, which you can get stuff done that way, too. That's the Western mindset. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, dig, 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 and I'll dig myself out of this uh, jail. Uh, okay. But the door might have been open if you checked it. So there's, there's, uh, that's a good place to start. But I always start with uh, strengthening the mind. And so people are already interested in strengthening their bodies. They want to get super strong bodies. And if you do not balance that with a super strong mind, you will be, by definition, out of balance. And you won't get as far. There's no way. Strong mind, strong body. I mean, people have been saying that for centuries. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true, you know. And so uh, I try to convince people that they have to strengthen their mind. Even if they don't, it's not about knowing stuff. It's about having a sharp mind. It's not about knowing facts and saying, uh, what's the fastest land animal? What's the, what's the highest peak in North America? How many meters in a mile? What's the capital of South Dakota? If you know those things, you know them. So what? That's not intelligence. That's not sharp mind. That's just memory. A sharp mind is just somebody that can take a situation, like in training or in a competition or on the field, and they can figure a way. They can, they can use their mental acuity. And come out on top. Or at least give it a good try. So I, I, actually, I call it sharpening the mind. You know? And mm -hmm. I love reading stuff. But it's not about reading stuff for, um, for the sake of learning data. It's, it's exploring ideas. I gotta let my cat out, sorry. Uh, it's exploring ideas that you might be able to apply in your life or in the weight room. And the sharper your mind is outside the weight room, the sharper your training will be. Because it is undeniable, you know physiology, the brain tells the muscles what to do. The mind, the brain, is responsible for setting everything you do in the gym in motion. So if that's sluggish and sloppy, um, that's how your training is going to be. So, you know, reading, mm -hmm. think, and being comfortable in your head. So powerlifters, people in the gym, they're very physical people. They're already pretty comfortable in their bodies. They know what that's about. Well, most of them. Some people are running from their demons and punishing their bodies. But uh, aside from them... Um, <laughs> they like they like working out they like sweating they like straining and they're okay with that but you get them to sit in front of a wall for 15 minutes and they can't be in their own head they are uncomfortable so i've got a question then uh for you jam so when i was younger uh i well this is something we had, we chatted about this uh quite a bit yesterday um so when I was younger, I was quite introverted. I'm still pretty introverted. And so I ended up uh, getting into reading a lot. And so I would read a bunch. And I would read, um, initially when I started, actually, I got into a lot of the books that my brother would read. He was very into, like, Tai Chi and meditation, stuff like that. So I, would, I started off with a bunch of that. And I must have read, like, I don't know. I read a lot of books in that realm. And then I started going into different realms and kind of, you know, dabbling here and there. And, uh, one thing that I found was, I think sometimes when you start reading a bunch of different books, you get other people's voices in your heads. And I think sometimes that can be really helpful because it can offer guidance. But for me, I almost felt like it made me more confused. And so the reason why I stopped reading a lot of those books was actually because I found that the more that I just accepted who I was and the more that I started behaving in ways where I'm like, you know what, this is what I think is right. Not necessarily what 
you know, these books say or whatever, that's when I started getting better results, having a better quality of life. My training was just better. And I was able to like trust myself a little bit more. You know what I mean? And that seems sort of like counterintuitive <clears throat> because there's a lot of, you know, people who are like, oh, you need to read a lot. You need to read a lot. And I went from reading like, you know, over a hundred books a year to reading nothing. I don't think that those two things are mutually exclusive. I do understand because people have said exactly what you're saying to me. I'm so confused. Uh, I, you know, I read this and I read that and I don't, but I don't think that having other people's ideas in and looking at them and, and rolling them around in your head means that you ever have to abandon your instinct and your own ideas. What, what I, what I try to tell people is that if, if your ideas are solid and th then they'll hold up to, to scrutiny against other ideas, don't ever be afraid to, to put your ideas out there with other ideas because in the end, you always get to decide if you believe something or if you don't believe something. And so I don't think it ever hurts to put new ideas in our head. You don't have to keep them. So I think it's when you think every idea is equal. And they're not. So it's like opinions. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you about opinions, you know. <clears throat> everybody says, you have your opinion, I have mine. I'm like, yeah, but, but you don't know nothing about this thing. And I've studied it for years. So yeah, you mm -hmm. have one opinion. You think this, I think that. But they're not equal. Mine holds more weight. And the example I always yeah. give is me in my car. You know, if I take it to a certified mechanic, and he says, this is what we should do with it. And I'm like, nah, I don't think so. I think we should do this. I don't know anything about how cars work. He knows everything. So we, we, I guess we're, we're just going to have to disagree because he says one thing and that's his opinion. And I say one thing and that's my opinion. Even Steven. No way. No way. No way. So it only becomes a problem if, if you have difficulty um, weighting those ideas. Some are going to be more important to you than others. And they will either align with your paradigm or you'll be able to fit them in somehow where they won't. And so you don't have to keep that extra stuff around. Those voices can go. The ones that, that, that should stay are the ones that, that fortify your position or have maybe even modified your position. Those are the best ones because then you grow. If you just read stuff that agrees with you, and that's what people tend to do a lot of times, they just want to validate their own opinion. And that's not growth. Um, but, but throw some of those different ideas, and I, I, I'm impressed that you have already read the Tao of Fu, um, and you did mention how much you used to read. But uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a very uncomfortable book because it tells us not to strive. Now, I wouldn't wholesale go to that. I, I, if I had that voice and I was like, what should I do? Should I work my ass off or should I just go with whatever happens here? Um, that would be confusing. But I've learned that in certain situations, well, most of the situations I, I, you know, put the pedal down and I drive myself. But in certain situations I've been in, I've found that, man, it's good to have this other tool in there. It's good to have this other idea that's, that I can use if I need to. You know, if, if the pedal to the metal thing doesn't work, then what? Pedal to the metal again? You already got it maxed out. Doesn't go any further. Now what? Just quit on your goal? Mm -hmm. Just give up? Well, maybe there's another thing. And so having a few extra ideas in there, even if they're uh, not, even if they don't perfectly align, there's no rule that says all your stuff has to all, you know, be, be in line. You can hold different opinions about different things in different situations. That's fair. You know, this rule that we have, it's called a consistency bias. We, we have to be ultra consistent. If I, if I make this choice, I got to ride it out to the end. No, you don't. As soon as you realize it was a bad choice, you should turn around. You should turn around and do something different. But we, we nope, I don't want to be a flip flopper. I don't want to, I don't want to be seen as, you know, uh, wishy washy. I got to be committed. Yeah, you should be committed. But, but when you find out that's not really working, you got to commit to something else. You got to give up on the thing that's not working, and and so that that's what I that's what I think about uh, putting ideas in, mm -hmm. and we have to keep them in there, and they and they shouldn't all be confusing because some should be weighted 
in your opinion, more important than others. Now that may differ in my opinion, but you, you always get that, uh, higher function executive decision to edit those ideas and to re synthesize them in your paradigm so that they work. And ultimately I'm not so crazy about right and wrong. I'm crazy about usefulness, utility. So some people say, uh, credo veritas, which means I believe what is true. I believe the truth. And some people say, and you know people like this, uh, credo consolons. I believe what comforts me. If it's, if it's an idea that, that I like and it's comforting, I believe that. But I say credo quad utilensis. I believe that which is useful, even if it's not true. That sounds weird, right? How could you believe something that's not true? Well, if I can use it, if I can put it to use to get what I want, it doesn't have to be true. It gets me what I want. And we went to war. The Bush sent us to war on a premise of weapons of mass destruction. That was an idea that wasn't true, but it got them what they wanted. We went to war. Still over there. So that was that was a huge idea for his purposes for, for his purposes. I, I don't mm-hmm. know. But we're still over there fighting that war, and there's no weapons of mass destruction. Well, I think we're out of our. We're still in a, in Afghanistan stuff. Mm-hmm. You see, there's a, there's a usefulness factor to the ideas. So when you read a book, you should be looking for: is this true or isn't it true? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's interesting to think about, and that that that's fine. But you should be looking for how can I can I use this idea? Can I put this idea to use? Does this idea have an application in my life, and specifically in in how I'm gonna you know we're talking about power, how I'm gonna how I'm gonna approach my powerlifting, and and my my personal mental hygiene, how I'm gonna clean up the way I think about everything, so that the way I think about lifting is is cleaner and sharper. Yeah, so one one of the, I think one of the distinctions that I realized like later on was, uh, for for one of the reasons why, I stopped reading a lot of those books was I guess I'll use a comparison in powerlifting. A lot of the times, if a lifter doesn't have a really strong background in let's say coaching or, or program design or whatever, they might hear a new approach to training, high frequency training, or they might hear about BFR or some other, you know, flashy approach to training. And they might be concerned that they're doing something wrong because they're not incorporating that. Right. And so they can get very confused as to what they should be doing when, you know, they're presented with new information. And for me, I felt like that was my situation as well was because I didn't necessarily have a strong rooting in who I was as an individual, in in a lot of cases anyways. And that was why I was getting really confused. So now it's a little different. You know, I'm I'm 31. So, I mean, I should definitely have a much better sense of self than uh, I did when I was in my early 20s and teens and stuff like that. But uh, that's sort of what I attribute a lot of that confusion to, right? And I think that, like you were saying, once you do have that certain... It doesn't have to be this total level of clarity, but once you have a certain, once you have enough and and whatever that line is, is probably going to be different for different people. But once you have a certain level of certainty in who you are, you know, you can sort of begin to task out those different priorities, right? And like, hmm, what do I need a little bit more of? So like you were saying, maybe I'm not pushing quite as hard as I think in the gym. You know, I'm really focused on a lot of the technical stuff. Where are my blind spots? Where am I, where am I weak in terms of, not necessarily like a body part, but it's like, you know, maybe I could be getting a little bit more rest. Maybe I could be getting a little bit more of this. Maybe I could be getting a little bit more of that. And it's funny because when I first started coaching, never in a million years did I think that I'd ever hold the belief that, you know, what you're doing isn't so much as important as how you're doing it, you know, like we were talking about effort. And so, I mean, I think, yeah, for, for me, that was one of the big reasons why I stopped reading. And I think it kind of comes full circle, you know, where, because now I, I, I listen to some audiobooks and I do read, but mostly like I've chosen two or three people who 
seem to be really, really good influences on certain things. And, and I tend to focus a lot on them, you mm-hmm. know, because I find that that's where my weak spots are. Um, yeah. You, you yeah. mentioned a couple of them there, Dan, and uh, I want to highlight a couple of them, if I can remember. Um, you mentioned uh, at 22, uh, self-awareness as you do now. And that's, that's, that's true. Nobody. <laughs> don't, 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 that's, not a, that's not terrible. You're, you're, you're still becoming um you know someone into your prime and beyond hopefully um and and so you brought up this idea of self-awareness and having a good idea of who you are and that's that's super important and the only way to get that is to look inside a lot and you said you were an introvert you spent a lot of time alone so you probably did quite a bit of that even and i would suggest because i know it's true for me and I can't see how it wouldn't be true for almost anybody who's growing. I would suggest you read some of those books again, because at 31, you're going to read them differently. I was telling you about The Art of War. I've been reading that book for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And now I'm reading it in a whole, wholly different way, completely different way. I mean, it, it, is, it is so different that all of the words on the page are the same. I read, I read the Cleary translation a lot. But I am not the same, and neither are you at 31 than when you were 22 and when you read those books. They deserve a revisit probably, the ones that, that, that you think might be valuable, um, because you'll be surprised. Because you can't see that coming at 22. You can't see it coming at 25. And what you're doing right now at 31 will be different when you're 39. And you can't see that coming. You, you, have, to, mm-hmm. you have to – the Romans said um, – we march through life in a column facing backwards. We can see where we've been, but we're moving to where we can't see. And then what was the other thing that you mentioned that I, was, I thought was important? Uh, so I, revisiting that and um, when you were younger, self-awareness, I think, is something we could, we could even talk about. How do you develop that? It's all introspection. Oh, you mentioned blind spots, Dan. You mentioned blind spots and, ha- and, and working on those. And I, I, I looked into that just a couple months ago. You know, someone mentioned the blind spot thing. And, and what I found out was um, you're blind to them. You, can't, you need help. You need an outside source, someone you trust, to tell you about your blind spots. You can't go, you can't just sit down and say, uh, let's see, where, where am I? You can look at your weaknesses, the ones you recognize, but the blind spots will always be blind to you. Mm-hmm. And powerlifting is a fairly individualized thing. You can do it in your garage. We, I'm doing it now. But, um, you know, you need a little help comp- competing. But we all can not see uh, our own house. So it's like you own this house. And you're inside of it. And you want to see, and you can't get out. You can't get out of your own head. You can't get out from behind your own eyes. You can imagine, you know, yourself in a movie walking around, but that's just an imagination. You can't see directly the, the back of your head, per se, you know? And so mm-hmm. you're in the house and, and you're, you're, your buddy's walking down the street and you yell out the window at him and go, hey, uh, you know, what color is my house? What, what color is it? And, and he goes, it's, uh, it's white. And you're like, oh, okay, thanks. Because you don't know that until you get some help. And and guys that are in powerlifting, are, they probably tend to be guys that don't want any help. They, I, I, you know, if you're, if you're, you're pretty self-motivated. Uh, uh, I think a lot of guys, it's not a crazy social, it's not a team effort, really. Uh, it's just you and the bar up there all alone and that's the way it is a lot and i think that's what draws a lot of people like you and i to it um that that this is on me i live and die by my own effort and and that's you know i i hated team sports in high school uh i did my job right we looked at all the films the day after the game and i didn't make any mistakes and we lost and I was just pissed every time coming out of those films, looking at the other guys. And it was broken. 
And so I, I abandoned it. I abandoned it. I didn't want to be tied to anybody else's effort or lack of effort. And and I think that's difficult for us then to ask people them already. And they, they may not uh, because eh, you know how people are. They, they, they want to be a lot of people don't want confrontation and uh, so you got to find somebody that really trusts you that you that you really trust to help you see what your blind spots actually are otherwise you're never going to know about it. and mm-hmm. i've come to grips with this lately and and so if they're your blind spots likely they're a great great pregnant place for growth and development because you probably haven't done shit with them so that's a great Mm -hmm. find out you know don't be afraid of that and say i don't want to look because i don't want to know about something bad if it's in there good if 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 it's if it's undeveloped and you're really shitty at it uh wow there's a place you can go now to to improve and show a lot of growth in in a short period of time because it's relatively undeveloped so th- those are just some things I heard you say, and I thought they were worth commenting on. One of the things I started doing probably like four or five years ago was uh, was actually going around to all like my close friends <laughs> and being like, hey, what do you like about me and what do you absolutely hate about me? And then that kind of turned into what are my strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. And it was funny because the first time I did it, I was a little surprised with the answers, but not not really. It's kind of, you know, I, I had a similar perception of myself. Um, but then the second time I did this, so I do it, I do it about once a year. And then the second <laughs> time I do it, um, I thought it was going to be the same. But I think that they were just a little bit more comfortable with being nervous about me punching them in the face or something like that if they offended me, you know. And so they, they were, I think, a little bit more raw with their answers. And I was shocked, like, Every single answer I got was like I just didn't expect it at all. Like I didn't I didn't think that they were going to comment on that part of my life because I was so like all my attention was here, you know. And um, and then every year after that, I was always just like thinking that I had an idea of what they were going to say, and it was always something completely different. And I was like, oh my god. And it was funny because every time I'd hear this stuff, I'd always be like, nah, these guys are fucking idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. Whatever, whatever. And it's very easy to blow them off, right? But then I would always I, I, I would always approach it from the standpoint of let's just assume they're right. If they were right, what sort of observations would they be able to see? You know, like what, what sort of observations led them to that decision, right? And so I'd kind of try and do my best to behave as if it was true and then be like, okay, if, if what they're saying is true, this is what I'd be doing. So maybe I should try doing something else and see what happens. And I, it was a really interesting like thought experiment uh, to, to go through. And then I applied that to powerlifting as well one time and asked one of my uh, one of my training partners about like, hey, what do you think my biggest weaknesses are as as a lifter? And he told me, and I was like, oh shit, like that's really valuable. Like why why aren't more people doing this? You know, because you give each other tips and you're like, hey, like. You know, can you help me up with my squat? Hey, can you help me out with this? But at least I've never heard anyone actually go up and ask someone else, and, you know, hey, what what would make me a much better power lifter if I did, you know, if I did A, B, and C, right? What, what are those things that I need to do? And so I think that's definitely a really interesting exercise to, to implement in your own training if you have good lifting partners or if you have access to maybe some people who are more experienced. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful technique. I totally endorse that. That's really good. You know, just the, just the part about going to your friends and asking about your personal strengths and weaknesses is a really good practice. But then, uh, obviously, in, in sport, uh, you know, your friends might not tell you about your personality as much, but I think, I think you'll get some good feedback in the gym. Like you said, they really got more comfortable. But that's a wonderful practice, Dan. And, and what it shows is – the willingness, again, and that's a big word for me, the willingness to, to find out about yourself. And, and I don't think there should be any fear in doing that. And a lot of people pull back from that. They don't want to look inside or they don't want to ask somebody about what they think of them because they're afraid to find something they won't like. And that's okay because if you look inside and you find something you like, good for you. 
And so I think that's a good technique that you've got there. I, I can totally endorse that. So outside of um, just some of the things you talked about reading and just having that, that willingness, like how do you go about developing that willingness? Because for a lot of people, it's not necessarily there. You know, like if you've, if you've kind of had like one of those tough upbringings, you just have to be a little, a little more rough around the edges, you know, but if you didn't, and I mean, like when we first moved to Canada, it was not the greatest situation, you know, but living here now, I mean, it's, it's pretty cushy compared to a lot of other places. And, and so, I mean, I think it's a little easier to fall into the mentality of, I, I don't even necessarily want to say soft because it's just, it's just a different environment that requires you to adapt in a different way. Right. But specifically for lifting weights, like, the people who are who get pretty far like have a pretty consistent mentality you know about themselves um so how do you go about actually developing that mentality and developing your character to make you one of those high performers you know even if you don't necessarily have some of the physiological benefits how can you make up for some of that with your mentality and your, your actual mental approach good question so um there's a there's a uh there's a therapy called ACT. Let's see if I can remember what it, it's acceptance. Um, oh man. I don't know. The C stands for like take an action. I forget what the word is, but you accept what's going on. Then you, uh, then you take action, you move on it. And it's a kind mm -hmm. of type of therapy. But the first part of it is all about acceptance. And they do this uh, stuff where you have to begin to accept being uncomfortable. And I've heard this from Navy SEALs and I've heard this from long, long distance runners and, and uh, athletes that uh, one of my ex-wives ran a marathon and she said she wanted to do sub four, four hours. And I looked at her and I said, I don't even want to do something that feels good for four hours. That's crazy. Running for four hours? I would be so uncomfortable doing that, right? Um, so what they teach you is they teach you to accept the state of being uncomfortable. And uh, a way you can practice this, and you, you said, how, how do you learn this? Well, you learn what it's like. And this is also a way you can learn to build it up. Um, you hold your breath. Remind yourself. You see how long you can go. And you and I could do it right now, but we won't. And you, you mark down how long you can hold your breath. And then you spend five minutes. It's sort of like a meditation. And you med mentioned meditation already. And I think it's super valuable, too. Uh, and you think about this. You think to yourself, okay, I'm going to hold my breath again. But this time, instead of seeing how long I can go and what number I can produce, what I'm going to do is I'm going to accept. I'm going to be willing, willingness, willingness again, Dan. I'm going to be willing to feel uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. And I'm going to see what that really feels like because we always run from that. We get a little, you know. If our if our house gets a little too hot, we turn to turn the AC up. If it gets a little too cold, we turn it back up. I mean, it, it's crazy how comfortable we, we, our life can be with all our technology. So we are absolutely out of the habit of being uncomfortable. And we run from it. And so th this this therapy, and it, it's for other stuff too, but this this is a great application of this. Uh, you you say to yourself for five minutes, you keep you keep telling yourself. I'm going to be very uncomfortable and I'm not going to just run. How long I, I can just sit in an uncomfortable state, choosing the uncomfortable state. And when you choose it and it's not forced on you, someone's not holding their. Uh, when you choose it, you get an autonomy. You feel some control <clears throat> over, the, over the uncomfortable situation. Because you know you can breathe anytime. You just open your mouth to breathe. And so for five minutes, you prepare yourself this way. You say, I'm going to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to choose to stay in the uncomfortable place 
longer and longer and longer. And this is a huge word here too, with curiosity. I'm going to be curious to see what that uncomfortable feeling really feels like. What does it actually really feel like? Because we start to feel uncomfortable and we don't really feel it. We, we don't let it develop. You know? We don't. We, we, we run. We run like crazy. And and if you ever and, and you can do this with you can do this with weights too. You could do a, a long high rep set and let that lactic acid build up and keep going. Or you could just hold a plate in your hand at 90 degrees. Hold a 45 pound plate in your in your arms, standing up like you're doing a curl, but don't move it. See how long you can hold that. Oh, there's lots of ways you could do this, but you're going to be uncomfortable, and you're going to hold your breath and see how you do. The the small change that only took five minutes, it was a change of your attitude, will probably you'll probably go significantly far. Mm-hmm. Just by changing your, your relationship to the, to the thing. So you're not going for a number here. You're not, you're not trying to achieve anything. What you're trying to do is feel what uncomfortable feels like. You're going to be curious. Do I have to breathe now or can I go another split second? Can I go another split second? Do I have to breathe now or can I go another one? Can I? Very curious but very committed to not running away from the uncomfortable feeling. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the thing about like those sniper guys and, and those guys that go out in the field and they, they, they don't move for like four days and they're in their own feces and urine and bugs are crawling on them and they, they don't yeah. move. If you've ever laid still for a very long time and not changed your position, it becomes ridiculously blood flow doesn't go to the to the skin and the muscles and and the joints lock up and it is crazy painful holding still and no guy and those guys they don't eat they don't they don't sleep they don't move for for very long periods of time Un- unbelievably long periods of time H- hard to believe actually some of them may be exaggerated I don't know I- I'm gonna believe them because they're so they're so uh, believable I, I i don't know maybe they're not believable it's i haven't decided it's like some of those guys lay for like four days in in the tall grass waiting for a shot that one guy in vietnam i read his book and um yeah but but they understand that they can be uncomfortable and they've learned to deal with it they don't run from it it doesn't mm-hmm. destroy them it doesn't want to be uncomfortable you're going to breathe again. Just wait it out. Wait it out another couple seconds. Wait it out. Wait it out. Go a little longer. Be a little more uncomfortable. What you'll find, Dan, or what I've found, and, and the people that I've taken through this kind of stuff in a gym, um, you'll get to a point where everything you do, every rep you do, every little bit of effort you do hurts more and more and more. So if you do one more, it hurts more. And if you do one more, it hurts more. And then you cross the line. You're already at a 10 in pain. And you do another rep, but it doesn't hurt anymore. It doesn't hurt any more than it was hurting. It's still a 10, but it's not more. And then you do another rep. And it doesn't hurt any more than two reps ago. And you do another rep. And now you re- it's, it dawns on you, I can do this forever, maybe. Because I'm already tolerating all the pain that this thing can give me. I made it. This can't hurt any more than it hurts now. I win. I can just keep doing this. And it is shocking. It is shocking to see somebody. I was training a professional baseball player. and We were doing pull-ups. And he was just suffering, suffering, suffering. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't. And I said, okay, we're going to stay here. I'm going to order a pizza. We're going to stay here until you get that set of, you know, 15 reps or whatever. And so I said, the more you try and fail, you get like eight, nine, you know, the more you, you're just going to get more tired, but you can do this and you have to do it before we leave. So we're just going to stay here until you do it. And of mm-hmm. course, it's over. about a half hour later, Dan, he had to be incredibly exhausted, right? This is, this is about that, how we always operate at 30% of our potential. And he's failing and failing and failing. He doesn't think I'm going to, you know, stick it out, but I am. And dumb. He just, he just changed everything. He did like 
oh, I don't know, 25 reps. I, it was just absurd. At that point in the training, at, at the, you know, it was the end of the training anyway. So he had already done his back. And, and you know, he had failed so many times. He had, he, had a, he, had a, he had proof that he couldn't do it. He had failed so many times. That was the data that he was collecting. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. See? Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. And then he it. <laughs> so what you, you, you do that too with the reps. You, you get to a point where it hurts more, it hurts more, it hurts more, it hurts more. And then you do another one, doesn't hurt much more. And then you do another one, doesn't hurt anymore. It's, it's still a 10. It's still awful. You are screaming pain. It's burning like somebody poured acid on your muscle. It's not real fire, though, Dan. It's not. But if you can get there a couple times. And it, it's, it's, it's rare, you know. But once you do it, you know you can do it. And then when you need it, when you say, I got to do this thing like I did it before, where I went. And I pushed myself through the, the, the worse and worse and worse and worse and worse pain. But then I know if I don't quit, if I hang in there with this really uncomfortable feeling, I can get to a point where I can do an amazing amount of work and it won't hurt any more than it hurts right now. So I want to do all that extra work. So you can hold your breath and, and uh, time yourself and then. Change your mindset with this acceptance. I'm going to accept. I'm going to be willing to feel this. And I'm going to find out what it really feels like to be really uncomfortable. And I'm going to see if it, it destroys me, if it ruins me, or if I come through for myself. And once you do that, you, uh, you got it in your toolbox, man. You can pull it out anytime, any day, anywhere. I've pulled that one out working here on a little hobby farm where I had to do yeah. some shitty stuff and I was miserable. And I'm like, okay, this is just like being uncomfortable. I can do this and I have to do it. This is my job. So yeah, you can pull it out anytime you want them. And that's when you become unstoppable. I think one thing that's kind of interesting and something that I've sort of observed, and I think most people have observed um, especially once you get to a certain level of, you know, experience, let's say. Um, it's so funny how, <clears throat> like you said, once something, like once you believe something's possible and then once you see it. So like, for instance, I, right now I'm in Calgary and I'm training at uh, a gym called the Strength Edge. And right now there's uh, the owner of the Strength Edge or one of the owners is this very, very strong deadlifter, uh, Bryce Krawchuk, I think is his last name. Um, and he competes in equipped and he also competes in, in raw. Right. And so I think he still has the deadlift world record in his weight class at like, I think the one Oh five kilo class, he deadlifted like eight fifty five or something to that effect raw. Um, so he's, he's a really strong guy. And I remember the first day that I walked into the gym and here's the thing. I didn't know he was an equipped lifter. Um, or I didn't know he was doing this equipped. But I walk into the gym and literally right in front of me, he's unracking 805 and squatting it, right? It's equipped, but I didn't know it was equipped. And I saw this and I've never seen anyone lift that heavy before. And I was like, holy shit. Okay, well, if he can do that, then you know what I mean? Like all of a sudden my barrier changed, you know? <laughs> and and I think it's it's kind of similar to that four minute mile thing, right? Like the first time someone ran a four minute mile within a year, like 30 people had done it. Now I don't know if it's 30 or 20 or 10, it doesn't matter. The point is multiple people had done it. And prior to that, no one in history had done it, you know, or at least recorded it being done. And I think that's something that's really important. And so I think sometimes at some point, even though, you know, training to failure is kind of frowned upon in powerlifting and whatever, because of the fatigue, I think sometimes it's beneficial just even psychologically to push yourself there because like a lot of, I think once you get to a certain level of strength, everything just feels heavy. Like for me, if I'm squatting, like 400 feels heavy, 500 feels heavy, 600 feels heavy, but they all feel the same type of heavy. You know what I mean? And, and I don't know, I don't know why that is, but that's just how I feel. Right. And so sometimes when you're lifting a weight and you're like, Oh man, that feels really heavy. But then it's like, well, could you have done more weight? It's like, I don't know. Let's try. And then you do it, and all of a sudden you do more weight. 
but it feels the same level of heavy or the same level of difficulty, you know? And so I usually try and get athletes to steer away, especially if we're doing like an RPE style of training or, or, or that's what we're doing for that particular exercise. Sometimes I get an athlete being like, oh, it feels heavy, you know? So I stayed here and I'm like, well, no shit, it feels heavy. It's heavy, right? But it's not about does it feel heavy or does it feel light? It's can you do more? Do you have the physical ability to hit an RPE 7? You know, can you do three more reps after your set? And then, like, I literally had this conversation with one of my athletes the other day. And I shit you not, she put another 10 kilos on her bench press for her top set. <laughs> and she yeah. thought she was at her max. And I was like, no, I was like, that's nowhere close. And she tosses another 10 kilos on and smokes it. And that was her act. That was actually where she should have been at. And I was like, OK, so you're 10 kilos shy here. Where else are you 10 kilos shy? Where else are you five kilos shy? That's just one set. Now let's add up all the sets on all the exercises on all the days over a six month time span. How much do you think you're missing out on in terms of progress? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, just because yeah. you don't necessarily know your limits. And so I think it's really important to, even though, okay, sure. Again, taking a squat to failure, probably going to fuck you up for a while. Right. But at the same time, I, I do think that there's some merit to, to taking things to failure and there's strategic ways to do it obviously and you can even do it like you said with like a belt squat or a leg press so it's not going to generate as much fatigue but i think allowing yourself to get there and when you're like holy fuck i'm done and then just having someone yelling in your ear being like uh uh you got 10 more you think you're done you've got 10 more reps and then them actually crushing out 10 more reps like their level of who of where they think they're at just goes through the roof like their limits have now changed you know and so I think that's a really valuable exercise to put yourself through every now and then, <laughs> even though it feels like shit. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, uh, there's two things there, Dan, I want to comment on. And um, one is that um, someone asked me one time, what's it feel like to, to, to bench 700 pounds? And I thought about that. And I said, it feels exactly like when I benched 400 pounds. When I benched 400 pounds, <laughs> was all I could do, it took everything I had, 100% of my effort to move that up. And that's exactly what it felt like at, at 700. And it really is. And I understand why that is now. Because now I teach this. So I didn't know exactly why that was when I answered that question. But... I teach now to, I call it, don't respect the weight. Don't feel the weight. Don't mm -hmm. feel the weight pushing down into your hands. The heft of the weight, the hundreds of pounds pushing downward with gravity. Feel instead the power and energy of you, your will, your might, your strength, pushing up on the bar now where the hand meets the bar same amount of pressure but one <laughs> way of looking at it one frame of reference is this bar is coming down on me man it is it is pushing me down the other frame of reference is i don't even feel the bar all i feel is me pushing up and i realized that I was doing this when I would take the bar out and before I would say, uh, okay, for my liftoff guy, I would, I would flex up as if I had just won the rep, as, as if I had just completed the rep. And I, I pushed up and I, I, I tensed everything up briefly to, um, I don't know, to set the, the, the end point in my mind, but also to block out any pressure that I would feel from the weight. Now, of course, there was tons of pressure, but in my mind, I was generating that pressure. That wasn't coming from the weight. That was coming from me. And it is the same amount of pressure, but it, it, it's a different way of looking at it, and it changed my relationship to heavy weights. I refuse to feel them. I only want to feel me. And so if it's, if it's, it doesn't matter what's on the bar, I can't feel it, and I do not feel it. I disregard it. I purposefully don't pay attention to it. 
I distract myself with something else that I can pay attention to. I never, ever feel the way. Ever. Never. I, I think that makes sense because, like, I mean, at the end of the day, either it's going to it's gonna move or it's not, you know? Yeah. So, like, I, I sort of, like, joke with, with uh, some of my, like, training partners, you know, that every time I get under a bar and I've got to do, like, a really crazy set that I've never done before, I'm literally just, like, I unrack the weight and I'm like, good luck, let's see what happens, you know? Because, <laughs> like, and I just focus on my technique because if I focus on my technique – what I want to happen is going to happen. But if I'm focusing on, Oh, this feels heavy. Then my tech, like my attention is away from where it needs to be in order to execute the lift, which is on the technique, you know? So it's like either clearing your mind or like, I'll give myself one or two cues before I unrack. And then it's just blank and there's nothing there. And I'm like, all right, good luck, man. And then, you know, <laughs> we'll see what happens on the other end. So I, I, I get what you're saying uh, from, from that perspective as well. There's a, let's take that another step too, Dan. So I spent a lot of time on technique. I did it myself and I do it with everyone. Cool. In this, it, it only happened later in my career, but when I would go to a meet, my technique was so ingrained and subconscious that I could sort of step out of my own way and just concentrate on the fierceness of my heart. And so instead mm -hmm. of, instead of it going from my brain to my muscles, I sort of, I sort of put the brain muscle thing into a, a rote habit that was automatic. Now you've got to put a lot of time into your technique years and, it, and every single rep in the gym has to be focused on everything that has to go right. But then that allows you the freedom to not think about your technique at the meet and to just let your spirit run the muscles. It kind of bypasses the, uh, the mind because the mind and the body have, have built such a, a strong pattern. It is as perfect as you can make it that you don't need to think about it. You don't need to concentrate on that. You can concentrate on effort, 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 will, will, will. I will do this. This will happen. And I spent all of my time in the gym focused on technique and all of my time on a platform focused on desire, running straight from the heart, getting out of my own head. I don't even remember some of the meets. That's a fact. I do not remember them. I can't tell you much about what happened because I was able to step big. And the only reason I was able to do that, the only thing that allowed me to do that was having an almost perfect technique. And the only way I got that was to do excruciatingly detailed focus and awareness on my technique in the gym. But that's a benefit of being really diligent in the gym and ma and trying to really master your technique. Then, when the tech when the, when at times come, so I guess this would be like, um, you know, a horse that knows its way back to the to the barn. If the rider falls off, the horse just puts itself away. It's done it so many mm -hmm. times. With the rider on, it doesn't even need the rider. I guess cowboys would uh, get drunk and they would just put them on their horse and slap the horse and it would take them home you know, from the bar, the, you know, the <laughs> drunk guy, you know, because the horse knows the way. And that's like our body, you know, I want my mind and body to just do it. But the only way you can trust that, and I call this trusting your training. Can you trust your training? Did you train diligent? Were you paying attention when you trained? Were you doing everything as good as you can and taking notes mentally and on paper, maybe, and maybe even digitally with your phone? Were you, were you really paying attention to your technique? And if you are, it should be getting better and better and better. And there should be less and less and less to correct. And at some point, you, you pretty much got it. For your body, you pretty much got the leverages. And at that point, you can trust them. That's so funny because, like, the, the whole concept of trust is something that, like, I'm, I'm a huge, huge believer in as well because so – I first got into lifting weights in about 2012. Um, that was when I first started lifting weights. And, and 
I was very fortunate. So I was a uh, Olympic weightlifter. That would like, I didn't come in to weights from like a bodybuilding standpoint. That was the first time like I ever really got into it. And so it was all snatch, clean jerk and squat. And I didn't know anything about my body or like what the fuck I was doing <laughs> with regards to lifting weights. And, uh, the, the coach was, he was the former head Olympic coach for the Russian national team, um, uh-huh. for Olympic weightlifting. And so like, this guy's friends with like David Riegert and like Yuri Vardanian, Alexei Vasiliev was like his training partner. <laughs> and so this guy was like super hardcore. And I remember him talking and he's like, he's like, it's never acceptable to miss a rep ever. He's like, if you never miss a rep in training, are you ever even going to think about missing a rep on the platform ever? He's like, no, because it's not something you have any experience with. You're only ever going to know success, you know? And, and he's like the level of confidence it gives you. And, and essentially he was saying the same thing about, about trust, right? It's like, you can, you can look back at your training and be like, nah, I, I crushed this last training block and the training block before that and the training block before that. And it just keeps feeding that confidence and that reassuredness and like, Hey, I got this. Like when was the last time I missed a rep? You know? And like, if I think back to the last time I missed a rep, I'm like, I don't know, you know, I'll miss like. In the last five years, I've probably missed like six reps, you know, in, in training. And it's just like, it doesn't happen very often, you know, like, so yeah, no, I totally agree as far as the whole trust thing and like locking in that technique and being really intentional in the training. That's why for my training, I would do my warm up, and then I would do three near max singles, not maximal singles, near max singles. You need to practice the one rep max if you be able to do it real well. But if you always one rep max, you're going to beat your joints, you know, right off your body. So I need to mm-hmm. practice that mentality and that feel for it, you know, getting getting yourself packed in and 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 right, you know, uh, braced in and and all that 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 only only happens under a big big weight and and not miss because you don't want to practice missing. Right, you don't want to get good at missing, and you don't want to get good at, at failing. And so my answer to that was not maximal efforts, near, near max, almost the max, but not the max. Something that was guaranteed, guaranteed to go, but was close enough to the max that you could feel what it's going to be like and practice it and get ready for it. And so, so like an, an opener on. On like a competition day or something like that, or around there. A little bit more than that, yeah. A little more a little than that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but 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 you get the idea. You know, you have to yeah. find your own way with that. Yeah. So it has to feel it has to feel right to you. Um, and maybe maybe it could be an opener. You know, if that it, and and I don't mean feel in your body. I mean in in the in your approach. You have to practice setting up. You have to practice chalking up. You have to practice your wrist straps. You, everything should be a habit. I, I'm a big ritual guy. Huge ritual guy. Um, mm-hmm. Now, if the wrist is broken, you've got to be flexible enough to, to make do. But uh, how many times does that happen? Not as much as it's like it's like a golf swing. You know, it, It's not like you're hitting a ball from a polo pony You know, where everything's different yeah. every single time. Everything's the same every single time. So you got plenty of time to set up and get everything right, but you got to practice it. Why would you leave anything? I mean, I, I, I do a huge ritual, huge, much longer than, than you would believe, but everything is part of the ritual and everything is as close to the same as I can all the time. And then those near maxes, uh, they're not as brutal. They're, they're fucking heavy, but, uh, they're not, they, they're not as brutal as a max, but they give me the practice of doing a max where lots of people don't get that. And I never, ever miss, right? Like you said, mm-hmm. never, never, never miss. So I've got a couple questions about that actually, because I've been super interested in how you structured your training, because on the one hand, it's, it's very intuitive and I'm a, I find that those are the things that are a little bit more appealing to me nowadays are these kind of intuitive approaches because they end up being very creative, but then at the same time, super adaptable, right? It's not a principle. It's like, 
I do this because of this, I do this because of that, and you can do whatever the fuck you want with that information. So I know that you, you know, you've talked about your six by six approach. So you, you do a six RM and then you do that, you know, for six sets. And then eventually, you know, once you are able to do six sets of six with your previous six RM, it's no longer your six RM, right? So would you do that every week or would you alternate that? So like, let's say every other week. No, no, I do that every week, every single week. And then closer to the meet, I would do triples. Okay, so you you wouldn't do your your top triples when you're doing your six by six, or you still would? No, no, no. So when you're when you're training out from a meet, six by six, mm-hmm. and then as you get at some point, you have to decide, you know, how, when you're going to start, you know, bringing it in for the meet, and that's that's the triples. Now here's the problem: if I were to train, so so this is all based on one scientific principle the law of sports specificity you get better mm-hmm. at what you practice so if oh I sorry were... actually i realized sorry to cut you off i mean i realized that i i made a mistake i was talking about the singles the near max singles would you do those during your sixes as well yeah or you just... every oh, you could. here's how it worked out oh, dan wow. i would i would practice a meet every weekend i probably have done more meets in quotation marks than anybody on this planet. I don't care how old they are, and I don't care how long they've been lifted, because I did one every single goddamn weekend. So here's how I did it. I warmed up, pattern, ritual. Put my gear on, did three near max singles. Took the gear off, did my six by six, or my triples. That's it. That's the deal. So every weekend I did a meet first because that's what I'm going to do at the meet. I'm going to warm up with my ritual and I'm going to take three max efforts, not near max, right? And then the meet's Mm -hmm. over. So every weekend before I even trained, I did a meet. And it took me an hour to warm up and take those, those singles. And I did a meet every single weekend in my head and with my body. Now, it wasn't quite as demanding because they're near maxes and not maxes, but that's how I could compete any weekend of the year. And I did I did a lot of competitions. I could go any weekend because that's basically what I'm going to be doing anyways. In fact, right. case in point, my training's way harder than a me. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I'm surprised you're able to handle that level of fatigue. So you, you would do your max singles Only once per week. And then you would you would do six by six of of all three exercises or just the prescribed exercise for that day? Just a bench. Okay. But then you would do your singles for all three exercises. What three exercises, Dan? So like squat, bench, deadlift. Or you were just specializing on the bench press. I was a bench guy. I was a bench guy. I didn't have to do that. But if I did, those would happen on another day. It would be a squat warm-up. Squat near max singles, then squat right, training. Right, right, okay. Hmm. It would have been that, but no, I, I, you know, and and I do have a plan for 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 teaching people to do everything in one day, but right. I didn't have. Hmm. Crazy, yeah. Like the the thing that actually sounds uh, somewhat similar to um, oh, there was a book. Who was it? It was like Power to the People or something like that by. I can't remember his name. He was the, that Russian guy who was like big into the kettlebells and the stretch or whatever. But anyways, he, he had uh, a program from uh, uh, Konstantin uh, Rogoznikov. Um, and he was like, I guess, the CPU coach uh, for the Russian Federation or something like that or the Russian team. And what he would do was something similar. He'd have like his light days and his heavy days. But then he'd, he'd say, OK, work up to a six rep max. Um, you know, every so often, and then all of the rest of your training would essentially be predicated off of what you're hitting off of that, and then he'd just get you to work off the of percentages off of your 6RM. Um, I know it's different, but it's it's somewhat similar in the sense of, like, the progression strategy of how you're constantly trying to push and push and push that uh, that 6RM. Um, so I, I find it pretty interesting how even though there's, like, a lot of different executions, if you really strip it down to just kind of the skeleton 
a lot of programs that seem like they're very different carry a lot of the same fundamentals, you know? Like if, if you were to write out your program and I was to, you know, pull pull the program that I was just talking about and you were to kind of lay them together and then be like, okay, what's the main foundation that's driving the strength adaptations? It's going to be pretty similar. There's going to be a decent amount of overlap um, in, in terms of like the fundamental concepts there. So, yeah, that, that's really cool. Yeah, the thing that, that I was able to get that you don't get in a lot of the other programs is I got practice at being a competitor. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it's not for me to say who the greatest competitor in the world is, right? Who cares? But I was pretty damn good at it because I practiced competing. My gym time was to prepare me for what? To compete. That's, that's why I was in the gym, you know? So yeah. I, I took that. So, so the program that I developed for myself and that, that I have is, is to help you get good, not just at, at pushing a bar up. Yeah. But get mentally. So every weekend I had to get mentally ready for a meet. I practiced getting mentally ready too. You know, I got all that yeah. practice in all aspects of the competition, mental, physical, spiritual, every week. I didn't just go to the gym and do my physical training. Yeah. That's what people do. Some people have an inkling about mental training, not many. But I put the whole thing together. And that's, that's why an ordinary guy like me could do something extraordinary. Because I was, I was, doing, I was working three parts of me. Everybody else was just working their body. Good. You know, that's yeah. how we beat people. That's why, that's why I beat people that should have been me. Yeah. But the meat, you better believe I was ready. A lot of the times, and this is, I think, a lot more apparent in fighting, but it's still very apparent in, in powerlifting. Um, a lot of the times when people win, it's not because they won. It's almost more because other people made mistakes. Because at really high levels, what separates, you know, the top five lifters really is not that much. Like a lot of the times they're, you're talking like a couple kilos and it just, you know, you rely on someone else making a mistake in order to win. And so a lot of the times I find that those who are really, really consistent can overcome a lot of potential I guess drawbacks, maybe if they're not as genetically gifted or maybe they're not as strong in a certain lift, but if they're super, super consistent and the other guy's crazy strong, but he's maybe a little less consistent, you can put together a better total and be a little bit more confident in, hey, you know what? I know that I can do this. All I have to do is hit this lift and I'm going to win because he just, you know, tried to hit a PR and, and missed it because of whatever reason. So that, that makes a lot of sense from a consistency standpoint. Um, do you think it, it almost sounds also like doing the singles would sort of set you up? I don't, I don't know if there'd be enough of like a, a kind of like a post potentiation activation situation going on. I don't know if that would necessarily be the case within session, like hitting your top single and then, and then doing the back off sets at six. But I do think that probably the psychological benefit of doing that, you get under the bar and you're like, okay, boom, you smoke that. And now you're doing these heavy sets but it's still a reasonable amount of weight less. And it probably, I would assume anyways, that it probably gives you a little bit of a mental boost as opposed to just doing your sets of six and, and working up to that, as opposed to working up to heavy single, dropping it down. They're still going to be real hard, but because the weight on the back is, is or, or, you know, the bench or whatever exercise you're doing is different. I would imagine there's some sort of like a psychological benefit there where you're like, Hey, you know what? I just smoked that weight for a single this I'm doing for six, but it's a reasonable amount lighter. And so I would imagine that it would sort of convey a benefit there psychologically even and, and potentially help you push a little harder. Yeah, that reminds me of a program, well, a technique that guys I saw using. I, I didn't use it myself, um, but I did some heavy uh, – I used it sort of in a sort of way, kind of, but not directly the way I'm going to describe it to you. Um, mm -hmm. the guys would squat and they'd work up to, let's say they were going to do 650 and 
they would get up to like 605 and then they would put like 680 on the bar they would walk out with it and set up and then they would walk back to the rack or have guys pull the slide the plates outside of the collars off down to down to 650 and then they would squat and so they they would walk out and feel the and this is mm-hmm. guys that feel this is why I could do it but they would feel the huge amount of 680 on their back then all of a sudden it would get lighter and then they would squat it and they and they would say that it, it gave them you know I pretended like the 680 was the 650 then they took the, the 30 pounds off and then it felt easy and I guess that's mm-hmm. sort of to me that was sort of like be like um, so you see the you see the the thing they were going for there yeah, no, hundred percent. I, I I do know a handful of people who who use that strategy. I've never used it personally, but I can understand why why it's pretty effective, especially if you're like a crazy, you know, strong squatter, like uh, Milanichev or something like that. I know he uses that. Yeah, and and I think I think those are for people that have I, weaker minds. But you see the the see the, the concept. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> Dan, can you can you set your alarm clock ten minutes fast? If if it's actually seven o'clock, can you set your alarm clock set at seven ten or or you know, and and then when it goes off and it says seven o'clock, or I'm sorry, set it set it um yeah set it ten minutes fast. So when your alarm clock goes off at seven, it's really only six fifty. Mm-hmm. You really got ten more minutes. Can you fool yourself like that? See, I can't. I know people that sit there and watch five minutes ahead. And I'm like, you know you got the extra five minutes. You set it ahead. It's one yeah. thing if you don't know the watch is creeping up and it's a little yeah. bit faster. And it gives you and then you're then you show up and you're like, Oh, I got five extra minutes. Wow, I'm a, but I can't fool myself like that. And it seems like that 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 was um but you know that it seems like to me that would be like trying to trying to lie to yourself. And I, I just I'm not too good with that. But I did do this. I did do some lockout work in my competition grip from the pins with very, very heavy weight, much more than I could bench. And mm. for reps. And I think that, that that training and that stress on the bones and I think that actual training, remember, I don't try to feel the weight. So it, it it wouldn't be exactly what we're talking about here, but um, right. I think that did, that does inure you to heavy weight, and um, I, I, I did I did those on tricep days. So there there may have been some carryover, like you're talking about, but I don't know. It wasn't direct carryover, I don't think, in the same workout. But uh, if if you've had you know a hundred pounds more than you can bench in your hands and you've moved it. Even for a shorter period range of motion, um, you know, you 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 get a sense of being able. Yeah, you know, like you said, you know, confidence. Yeah. No, totally. That's awesome. So um, we're coming up on that ninety minute mark, so I want to be respectful of your time. So um, I guess the the one question that I do have, since we kind of veered off and went totally in, in our own thing, which was, uh, which was pretty cool. But the one question that I do like to ask everyone is what's one opinion you have that, you know, either sort of goes against the grain or isn't necessarily, you know, well substantiated, but it's something that you've experienced enough in your training to, to sort of stand behind. Yeah. Well, I think I mentioned it earlier. I think the biggest difference about the way I approach training is I I really focus on the things you can't see. Um, you know, I, I love weightlifting for kids because they can see five more pounds on the bar and they can they can see their progress. It's it's very numerical, it's very physical, it's tangible. Uh, they write the numbers down, I make them, you know, keep good records. They see what's happening. It's very, very apparent what's going on. And I think that's super good for their self-esteem and, and everybody's, everybody's self-esteem. That's one of the great things about weightlifting. And it's one of the caveats of isometric training. 
you can't really see that the, that you're getting any stronger. You're just pushing against the wall, and the wall's not moving. You're not moving. And you come back week after week and push harder against the wall. Now you'll get stronger, but it's not very motivating. It's kind of tough, you know. Um, it's unseen, and and that's the stuff I I work on uh, constantly. I mean, there's plenty of people with plenty of good programs, and, and um, th- th- that's all that's all well and good. And there's plenty of good technical coaches out there. I like to think that I'm a good technical coach. I, I know mechanics. I know physiology. I know kinesiology. I know I, that's important, you know. But the the thing where I differ, the where I split off is, I don't think those are the important things. I think those are the secondary things. I think the important thing is what's inside a person. So you give me a man who has what it takes inside, and I will make him a champion in anything you want me to make him a champion in. I promise you, because all I'll do is I'll spend a year, and I'll learn all the programs. So if it's shooting a pistol or a bow and arrow or basketball, or you tell me, you tell me, you, you tell me what sport you want me to make them great at. And I will follow the, the set tried and true programs of that, of that sport. I'll talk to those coaches. I'll see what, you know, I'll, and I'll follow their programs. But if I, if I can make that champion, he'll, he can be a champion anywhere because of what's inside. He can just choose a sport. And so when someone chooses a sport and come, come to me, I, I remind them that, you know, what, what makes you a champion? What's going to make you, what's going to take you farther is what's inside of you. Not all this outside stuff. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that that stuff is, is unimportant. I'm saying it's secondary. And I think everybody thinks opposite. So you asked me what was different. About and I think if you talk to coaches, they're going to start this conversation about their, you know, <clears throat> leverage or technique or sets and reps or percentages and that's that's not what i think is important i think we should start the conversation about what's on the inside what are you thinking what are you feeling and so dan there's a there's a three-step approach to that 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 you know that the muscles have to be told what to do from the brain right it's motor cortex right Mm mm-hmm Okay, so that that makes sense. You so you'll abide. You'll you'll agree with me that there's a body and a mind, and the mind tells the body what to do, right? The muscles don't mm-hmm. do anything by themselves, right? Yeah. So if you if you're if you're boxing, you know that the the motor cortex that runs your right arm is on the left side of your brain, and the motor cortex that runs your left arm is on the right side of your brain, right? You know that crosses over. Okay. When, so when you throw a punch, you got to choose, right? You got to choose right hand or left hand when you're in a boxing match, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've established that the brain on one side of the motor cortex is going to tell the arm on the other side of the body to punch, right? Brain tells right. the body what to do. Are you with me still? Yeah. Now here's where I'm going to, here's where I'm going to ask you a question. that's a little harder to answer, Dan. What? tells the brain to choose the right or the left arm what tells the brain to tell the body what to do that's that third thing dan pretty Mm -hmm. much everybody agrees with me strong mind strong body but there's something else that drives the mind the seat of the will that's what that's that's home base, man. That's where it's at. What tells the right. brain to tell the muscles? The muscles will do it, and the brain will do it. It'll choose right or left. What told it to do that? That's that spirit, that soul, that heart, that seat of the will. That's something else. And that's where it's at, man. And if you can get that going, you, you can tell the brain to do, to tell the body to do anything. And there are examples. There's a guy that got left up on Everest and he walked down himself. He was left for dead. It was a good book. They made a movie too about it. But that dude, mm-hmm. that dude's body was shot. His, he was in a coma and something brought him down off that mountain. 
there's other stories, uh, POWs, and I got all kinds of stories. I read these. I collect them as evidence. And I'm, when the body is shot, and when the brain doesn't even function anymore, there's something else that can drive us. And, and that's, that's what I think. And more, if not most, not all, but almost all our time. And I think mm. a lot of those people, I try to get them to that point where they, they start to accept this, uh, I can make my body do anything. I can make it do anything. And it's capable of doing anything because we're all operating at 30% of our potential, of human potential. And so our, our, our world-class athletes are operating at 40, 45. But every once in a while, we see one of these dudes that walks down off Everest and he's operating at 60 or 70%. And it is my contention that when we had to survive for a living every day, all of us did that. All of us had to put ourselves on the line and run away from predators and chase after prey and survive and survive and survive. And it was hard. And I believe we all have that still evolved in us, even though our, our life has gotten so easy. Pretty soon we want to drive our own cars. Our life is so easy now and safe that we've, we've lost touch with that primal higher functioning of our whole organism, body, mind and spirit. Whereas if you're getting chased by a uh, timber wolf and they were giant back then, I mean, it, it, you better put everything you have into it to survive. You better be smart. You better be clever. You better be fast. You better not just get tired and quit. I mean, you had to push to just to stay alive. And if you didn't, you didn't get to have any kids because you got eaten by the timber wolf. So you and I possess the, the benefit of all the toughest motherfuckers that, that there were back then. That's our ancestry. All the wimpy motherfuckers, they didn't have any kids, and their kids aren't around them because there aren't any. And so I believe we still have access to that. I, I think that we can get rid. I think we're, we're slowly devolving away from that because of the comfort of life. Because now we have, and I don't mean to be cruel, but we have kids that are born premature that never would have survived and we're, we're, our technology is keeping them alive, and they're not fit to be alive. They're, they're born without lung development, and they can't breathe, and so we breathe for them. And then they have kids, and their kids are weak too. And 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 we're de-evolving now. We're going against the survival of the fittest. We're letting the richest and whoever has the, the, the access to, to technology survive. And that's not evolution. That's de-evolution. But we still, you, you and I and the people... Most people still have a lot of evolutionary history in our bodies, brains, and whatever that third thing is. It's still there. That survival, that will, that ability to push the brain, to push the body, to do anything to survive. Now, a lot of people give up. They don't, they don't access it. But I believe we all have it. And so that's, that's probably the biggest difference, I guess, Dan. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. There's other differences, too. All right. Well, that was a really interesting conversation. Um, definitely not necessarily what I anticipated, but there's there's a lot of really great stuff there. A lot of great gems. Um, I'm definitely going to go back and and kind of make a couple notes to to bring into my own coaching and my own training. So, JM, thanks so much for for jumping on the call. Where can the listeners find you if they want to, you know, see more of your content, hear more about what you have to say? Uh, thanks for mentioning that, Dan. I'm at uh, YouTube at jm seventh level capital j capital m seven the number seven t h l e v e l and i have a instagram account under jm blakely and uh it's it's similar stuff um to what you and i discussed but uh it's it's even broader but i, I appreciate you mentioning that Dan. and also i i write for uh dave tate's elite fts uh, every month I put an article up there and I have a little coaching blog up there and every once in a while I head down and do, um, some live stuff with them and we, we tape it and, and that's, uh, that can be found on there too. Awesome. So all of that stuff is going to be in the show notes. You guys can check that out. It'll all be linked up below. JM, thanks so much for jumping on and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, thank you, Dan. I enjoyed it. Guys, thanks so much for listening. 
I hope you enjoyed the episode and took a lot from it that you can apply to your own situation to see much better results. I just have one quick personal favor to ask of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave me a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you're using. When you do this, it helps me get better at producing content and increases my exposure so I can continue putting out high-quality information for you guys. Next, I want to extend a personal invitation to shoot me a DM on Instagram at Stacked Strength. I'll help you troubleshoot anything you need. This is literally an invitation to connect with me directly, so make sure you head on over and jump into my DMs. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.